So uh, welcome everybody. Today we're going to be talking about ways to use hanging baskets. This is going to be kind of fun uh, because we don't talk about this a lot because you think a hanging basket's got a hook on it. I need to hang it up, right? And we love to hang up our hanging baskets here in the garden center. They add height. They add color up into a space that normally maybe doesn't have a lot of potential for color. And there's a lot of ways of doing it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do with hanging baskets. And the reason I bring this up is because sometimes you can get some really good deals on hanging baskets. Hanging baskets typically go on sale every once in a while. Uh, if you check out our website, uh, you might see that they're on sale now or in the future. So, uh, so using hanging baskets um, in different ways might benefit you and I'm going to show a lot of different things that you do. The first thing of course I want to talk about is how to keep your hanging baskets blooming all season long. So we re really really want to talk about just the, the art and the idea of growing a great hanging basket throughout the season. There's lots of different options for hanging baskets, inside, outside, what to plant. Uh, you can plant your own, but then there's a lot of different ways to use them. And I've got a really exciting finish. Hopefully it turns out all right. Um, so uh, I'm going to actually use some hanging baskets to plant up a combo container. You get to see the impact from that. Uh, let's see. I think I saw some questions. Uh, good morning, Susan from Michigan. Nice to have you. Uh, we like to skip over spring and head right to summer very abruptly. Yeah, and we've been there, Susan. We've definitely been there in the Hampton Roads area where it's all of a sudden it's summer before we know it. Uh, we've had a great long spring this year, and we love springs that, that last a long time uh, because it keeps the season kind of going a little bit um, and keeps us out in the yard a little bit more. But I know how that is, Susan, from going from cold to just all of a sudden it's hot. Uh, but here we get real hot, Susan. I don't know how hot you get in Michigan, but we, we'll get up into the hundreds uh, before we know it here in the next couple months. Um, so, all right, so hanging baskets. Uh, let's talk first about keeping your hanging baskets blooming and keeping your hanging baskets healthy and great looking. So, of course, we've got lots and lots of hanging baskets around here. I'm going to show you some of my favorites here in a little bit um, that we grow in the Hampton Roads area. But the first thing I want to do is show you uh, how to kind of keep a hanging basket growing. And, and really what I want to, this is going to look ugly and that's okay. It actually took me a long time to find one ugly hanging basket, one bad hanging basket. So 85 to 90 this week. Wow, in Michigan. Wow, that's getting warm. So you might be saying, well, that doesn't look that bad. Well, it's a little anemic looking so we can see the yellowing leaves. It took me a long time to find this hanging basket. Our hanging baskets are gorgeous. Um, but this one we probably got in early part of spring um, and maybe it missed a watering or something. I had to go back in the back greenhouse to find it. But you can see it's getting a little kind of uh, you know, empty in the center. We've got some yellowing leaves. We got lots and lots of brown petals in there. So you can see that it's just kind of struggling a little bit. Now in the summer months, you might find that your hanging baskets might even look worse than this. And that is somewhat normal. That's okay. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is deadheading. Deadheading is a necessary practice on a lot of hanging baskets. Not all. I'm going to show you some of my favorites. A lot of my favorite hanging baskets don't need deadheading, like this gorgeous dragon wing begonia. These petals are going to fall off once the blooms are done, and it doesn't produce a seed. It just keeps on blooming, so you don't have to worry about deadheading. But that's what deadheading is, is taking that seed out because plants flower to seed, right? Plants are going to flower to produce a seed. Like a tomato plant, you want the blooms, you want the seed because the seed is encased in the fruit and that's what you want to eat. So with a petunia or a uh, geranium, then they're going to want to try and go into seed form. Now, a lot of plants have been hybridized, a lot of annual plants have been hybridized to not seed as much, meaning it's not going to try and produce a seed or that seed is going to be non-viable and the plant is going to not produce it like a knockout rose. Think of knockout roses. They're awesome. You don't have to deadhead them as much. And the reason you don't is because that bloom produces a seed that it's trying to produce. And then all of a sudden it realizes that it's not viable. It drops it and it keeps on blooming. So we've tricked the plants into thinking that they don't need to do that. They just have to keep on blooming. And most petunias and million bells and lots of plants don't have to be deadheaded, uh, but it does keep them fresher looking and cleaner looking. So for example, we've got all these brown blooms in here. And so going through and picking these off, really does help kind of clean up your plant. It doesn't take a lot of time. Um, you know, petunias are a little sticky. So I'm sure if you've ever worked with petunias before, you'll find that your hands will get a little kind of almost like a sappy, sticky feeling to it, but that's natural. But just going through and just pulling out the blooms is a good practice. Now, some petunias and other plants will produce a seed. And so I don't know if you can quite see this, but right here 
is where I just pulled some dead blooms off, right? And I can feel that and it feels a little hard on the inside. Now it's producing a bloom on the end here. That's almost done, so I'm gonna take that off. But all of these, so it's got another bloom. This is a great example right here. So I've got this long uh, growth here from this petunia. All of these old blooms are pulled off now and cleaned up and it is producing another bloom here. However, if we go in and we just pinch these little green caps off that don't look like blooms, that's what it's gonna look like right there. I'm gonna zoom in on that. So it's got this little kind of thing. If we go through and pick some of those off, it does help it continue to bloom. Now it's not necessary, you don't have to do it, and typically I won't do it uh, much um, unless I see that it's really struggling to bloom, but the plant itself looks great. Then I might go in and do a little bit more deadheading, sit down, have a drink one night, and just sit there and just kind of selectively prune and clean them out. Now, you don't have to do that. What I typically do is let the plant kind of grow and it's gonna to start to look a little straggly looking and that's okay and then I'm gonna prune it back. I'm gonna show you how to do that in a second. Um, so, but I also wanted to show you another example of a plant like Lantana. So this is a Lantana hanging basket, one of my favorite hanging baskets because it just loves the heat um, and it just goes all summer long. Very, very easy to do. Let's see if I can show you this. So in here are some old bloom uh, seed pods that are starting to form. Now, Lantana is hybridized, as I mentioned before, um, to prevent these seeds from, from, from really forming a seed. So you can almost see in this seed head that it's starting to brown and die off, and that's good, that's what we want. However, going and picking these out doesn't take a lot of time, and it's pretty easy to do, and it just stops it from even trying to produce the seed because it's gonna keep on trying until this seed head dies. And once the seed head dies, then it'll say, okay, let me keep on producing blooms. So it does help to pull these out. You can see that old lantana. And it's starting to brown at the tip. So doing some deadheading definitely helps. Doing some cleaning definitely helps. It keeps your plants fresh, it keeps them good looking. Uh, you'll see it a lot with geraniums. Of course, I grabbed the one geranium that doesn't have any deadheads on it. <laughs> but, um, but when a geranium dies back or when the bloom starts to fade, then you've got this big brown kind of thing sitting up here. And so the easiest way to clean that up is just follow it down in. Oh, I do have one. I've got one little, you can see it right in there. See that guy? So that one's done. And it's gonna sit there and it's gonna go brown and then it's gonna eventually fall off. So again, you don't have to deadhead it, but if you just go in, and that's why I love geraniums because it doesn't take long to clean them up, and just take it all the way down as far as you can, then you're gonna get a nice cleaner look and it's a very easy thing to do. So geraniums need a little bit of cleaning up, lantana might need some, verbena might need some. I'm gonna clear off some of these hanging baskets here and pull this one back up because I wanna show how to prune them too. But before I get to that, how did we get here? Well, maybe we didn't feed enough, maybe we didn't water enough. So let's talk about that. I know I just talked about watering a little bit, opening up this video, um, but watering is extremely important when we're talking about hanging baskets. Hanging baskets are exposed, as much as exposed as they possibly can be, even more so than a container sitting on the ground or on a porch or patio. So a pot sitting on the ground is going to dry out faster than anything planted in the soil. However, a hanging basket is even more exposed. It's up, it's out, in, ex completely exposed to all the wind, wind is going to dry out a planter much, much faster. So hanging baskets are getting a lot of wind. They also are getting more sun typically, so they're gonna dry out faster. Plus they're in typically a smaller container as well, which means they're gonna dry out a little bit faster. And the best thing to do is use your hand to weigh it. So when it's hanging, just kind of lift it up. Okay, that's got a lot of weight to it, so I don't need to water. You can also use your finger or a moisture meter. So I can always take my moisture meter and just pop it in the soil and check what the moisture level is. So you have a couple different ways of kind of checking to see how moist your hanging basket is. I personally like weight. Um, hey, Deborah. Um, so uh, I personally like to check the weight of the hanging basket and if it's got some weight to it, then I know I'm good. Once it starts to get lighter, then I can water. Now, what I also like to tell people is try not to water um, as much as even maybe you've seen us do it. Um, uh, but the best way to water is to water and not let the water drain out the bottom. I know that seems kind of the opposite. You know, if you water it to the point that the water is just flowing out of the bottom, then you think you've done a good thing. And it's not bad, it's not the end of the world. But what is happening is, is it's flushing all those nutrients out of there. So what I want you to do, what I want to push you to try and do, and it's not perfect, and you're not always going to hit it perfectly on the head, um, but I want you to try and water 
with uh, the intention of watering it enough but not to the point where it drains moisture, drains all that water out of the bottom because you're just flushing all those nutrients out of there. So we're gonna talk about feeding here in a second. So when we water, we wanna water to the point where it's heavy, but not to the point where it's just flowing water out of the bottom. If you can do that, and it takes practice, trust me, I've been doing it for 17 years, and I still have not ever kind of completely mastered it because sometimes it's really dry. And that's another good point, point. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, we want to try and keep that moisture in there. And I forgot to bring this closer, but let me grab it real quick. This is my DRAM watering wand. And this is the best way to water hanging baskets. And it's really the best way to water anything in the yard or in the landscape or in your garden. Um, it is on every single hose here at the garden center. It is the best tool out there uh, for watering. It makes watering easier. It saves your back. And so if you've got a hanging basket up high, this long handle, this is a 30 inch handle, allows you to reach a lot of things. And it allows you, it's got that bent curve, so it's easy to water your hanging baskets. So this is a great tool if you don't have one of these and you live in the Hampton Roads area, you should come and pick one up. We've got them at all of our garden centers and our garden markets. So this is one of the best tools out there that you can use for watering. But once you mastered the art of watering to the point where the water's not pouring out of the bottom, then you're gonna save a lot of those nutrient uh, capacities, uh, the, the nutrient capacity holding uh, in that soil, in that uh, hanging basket. So try that. I think you'll be really excited about how the results will, will turn out for you if you water that way. Now, if your hanging basket gets way too dry to the point where we've got a soil cake, is what I usually call it, where the soil is starting to pull away from the walls of the hanging basket. Hopefully you don't let it get to that point, but if it does, then it might take some a lot of watering because what happens is you're going to water the water is going to pour off the top of the of the soil cake and it's going to go down the sides which is completely open because the soil is pulled away from the wall of the pot and it's going to drain right out of the bottom so there you might have to hit it five or six times you might need to water a little bit let it try and soak in water a little bit let it try and soak in keep going through that until that soil starts to loosen up and allow moisture in Try not to let your hanging baskets get to that point, but if they do, it might take a couple soakings. If you water and all of a sudden water starts pouring out of the bottom, it's either overwatered or it's way underwatered and that soil has pulled away from the sides of that uh, hanging basket pot. So hopefully that helps with some of the watering. Now, we also need to feed our plants. That's very, very important uh, with our hanging baskets and any container because as I mentioned, nutrients are gonna flow out of the pot. Um, and so that pot is smaller with a hanging basket. So we're gonna wanna feed a little bit more often. My favorite, of course, is our green leaf plant food here at McDonald Garden Center. This is our plant food. This is awesome formula. This is our traditional formula. It's great. It's a 12-4-8. It adds a lot of nutrients. It's got the micronutrients too, which I absolutely love. We also have it in our organic formulation. So that's a great option. So you've got two different options. You've got the organic or the traditional. Of course, traditional is gonna be a little bit stronger. Organic is gonna be a little bit lighter, but it's a really good organic one. Um, and of course, there's lots and lots of different types of plant foods out there. There's liquid plant foods that you can add to your watering, uh, into your watering can. Another good one is our blooming and rooting formula. This is awesome stuff. So whenever we talk about the three numbers, the, as I mentioned, a 12, four, eight, well, what is that? That's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three biggest nutrients that you need for your plants to survive. Now, nitrogen is green growth. It's gonna force a lot more leaves and it's gonna keep your plant healthy and green. Phosphorus, the middle number, is gonna develop root system and blooms. And then the last one is potassium and that one's kind of an all around. And so what I always say is up, down, all around. Upward growth, green growth, downward growth, roots, and also blooms. And then the last one is potassium all around protector. And so you got your up, down, all around, 12, four, eight with our uh, green leaf. This one is a nine, 58, eight. So you can see that huge middle number. And what that huge middle number does is makes your plants bloom more. So this is our blooming and rooting formula. This is a water soluble, it's a, it's a powder. You mix it with water and then you water your plants. So there you might have to use a watering can, but it is an awesome solution to kind of help force blooms on plants that you're like, hey, I'm deadheading this thing. I'm doing lots of good things. I'm, I'm, I know I'm watering it correctly. I've given it some other plant food. If you need to supplement some more phosphorus to help that thing bloom, then it's not a bad option to use a blooming and rooting formula. And there's a lot of other ones out there. Spoma flower tone. Um, there's a lot of different types of uh, fertilized out, uh, plant foods out there. I personally like granular plant foods. They last a little bit longer. So how many times do we need to feed? Well, something like a blooming and rooting formula or a liquid formula, whether it's these little drops or it's a water soluble, then a water soluble or a liquid plant food, we're gonna do probably every two to three waterings. So that's typically gonna be somewhere around once 
uh, a week or maybe once every other week. So that'll give it enough nutrients to survive, especially if we're not flushing the water out the bottom. With a granular fertilizer, you should get away with about a, every three to four weeks. So every month with an organic formula, I might do every three weeks with our green leaf. And then with our traditional green leaf, which I love, uh, this one I would do probably about every four weeks. So it just depends on your formulation. Um, but typically the, all of our uh, fertilizers are gonna, all of our plant foods are gonna have uh, instructions on how much to feed and when to feed. But a hanging basket is gonna lose nutrients faster. So to keep your plants blooming, then definitely feed them, water them, and uh, deadhead them. But the last thing is, okay, it's late summer, you know, it's midsummer, somewhere in that point and our plants are just unruly, they're huge. I mean, you see it a lot with petunias. Petunias grow very, very fast. Uh, but you might see it in a lot of different plants. I mean, look at this dragon wing begonia here is almost covering up this hook. So pruning is not the end of the world. Whether you're pruning to clean uh, or to prune to keep it a little bit smaller, all of those things plants don't typically mind. Now there are some specific plants that don't love to be pruned too much, but most of your hanging baskets, I couldn't think of one in a hanging basket that I was like, uh, I don't think I would prune this. Um, but I'm gonna do something to this hanging basket that's probably gonna scare you a little bit, but it really is the best way to bring these hanging baskets back to life. Now, I don't know that I would typically do this to this hanging basket. I would probably try and clean it up. I've got a lot of new green growth coming inside there. And with a little dose of fertilizer, I think this hanging basket would be gorgeous. But I need to show you how aggressive you really can be to clean up a hanging basket. Now this hanging basket's got verbena in it. You can see a little verbena bloom there. Um, and I think that's it. It just looks like verbena and petunias. It's a really pretty kind of strawberry uh, petunia. Well, ah, I take that back. There's a million bell in there too. So there's a little white million bell. So it's got three different plants. All three of those don't mind being pruned. And so what I'm gonna do is basically take this all the way back to the pot. I know that sounds aggressive, but this is gonna allow this plant to reflush and look really, really good. As Wendy said, that's my problem. I'm unintentionally doing that. So yeah, so definitely try and keep the water in the, in the pot if you can. I think that's what Wendy's talking about. So I'm literally taking this planter, this all of these hanging, all these uh, long shoots of the million bells and the petunias, and I'm literally just cutting it right to the edge of the pot. And I don't have to like think about necessarily where I'm pruning. So let me see if I can hold that up so you can see. See what I'm doing there? So I'm just literally just going right along the edge of the pot and just pruning it all off. So let me work around this and I'll do all of this real quick. And I know this seems harsh, and again, I probably typically wouldn't do this to this hanging basket, um, but I'm sure you've seen some hanging baskets uh, that you've either, ha either had or you've seen them at uh, other people's homes or even at garden centers uh, that maybe look like they could use a little bit of help. So that's what I've done there is I've just taken all that growth off the side because every time we prune a plant, right? So plant grows, Let's see if I can grab a piece here. So here we go, I've got a nice long shoot of this petunia. Every plant grows from a terminal bud. So it's always gonna grow from this terminal bud and it's gonna grow slowly. Whenever we prune something, it's gonna allow the plant more possibilities of breaking and growing more and filling in. And so you can see we've got some damaged leaves back here. It's putting energy into all of this and it's trying to support all of this. It's trying to produce a seed, it's trying to produce blooms, it's trying to produce new growth, and it's trying to keep these struggling leaves alive. So by taking all of that off, just makes it a little bit easier for it to kind of come back. Now I'm gonna even go a little bit further here and I'm gonna prune the top off as well because I really wanna take this thing back pretty hard. There we go. So I've even got one little, I'm gonna even take this verbena bloom off because I just don't want it to put a lot of energy into anything other than trying to rebound here. So now you can see when I was talking about that kind of gross inside there, right? So what I need to do, and I'm not gonna do it right now because it's gonna take too much time, is I would go in and kind of really clean this out and try and thin it out, try and get all these bad leaves out so that it really gets nice and clean. And then I'm gonna feed it. So I'm gonna use my green leaf plant food. This is an awesome, awesome fertilizer, as I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna sprinkle this in there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take it. I'll show you how to do this real quick. It comes with our little tablespoon here. So it's got a teaspoon marking and a tablespoon marking. I'm going to take a tablespoon. I'm just going to fill it up. I'm not going to be super, super precise with this. And then I'm just going to pull the plant up so I can expose the soil because I do want to get this on the soil. I don't want to get this on the leaves. I'm going to sprinkle maybe a teaspoon on this quarter. And then I'm going to open this one. 
sprinkle a teaspoon there. And then I'm gonna take another scoop and we'll come over to this side and we'll put another teaspoon and then we'll do the final teaspoon. So I've got about two tablespoons in this hanging basket. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a shake just to spread that around. And then the next time I water, it's gonna nice, it's gonna fill out. Now this is gonna take a little bit of time. So when you do this, this is what your hanging basket is gonna look like for about a week. And then it's gonna to start to reflush. And in about three weeks, this thing is gonna be gorgeous. Now I'm gonna go stick this in our greenhouse. It'll be ready to go in about two weeks. But in our homes, around our homes, put this in a spot uh, that gets good sun, but maybe I wanna give it a little reprieve from a full blasting all day sun. Petunias would love all day sun. But while it's rehabbing, I might put it where it gets uh, maybe a little bit of shade for, you know, maybe a couple hours or maybe like morning shade, afternoon sun, just so it's not having to really try and, uh, and fight the elements. Now, I'm not going to have to water as much when I do something like that. One, I've moved it into a spot that maybe it's not drying out as much, but also it's not going to need as much moisture because there's not as much growth. And so it's not going to need all that moisture to flow through its veins and out to all of its growth. So don't overwater at this point. That's a very important uh, 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 tip is don't water too much. You also might uh, see other things as I, I don't see here. So that's good um, is you might see insect issues. So if we've got insect issues, this is a great time to spray. I've got my neem oil and it's not a bad thing to be preventative rather than curative. So I'm actually going to take this neem oil. I'm going to turn it to a nice spray. I don't want stream, I want spray. And I'm just gonna take this neem oil and I'm just gonna spray it just a little bit. And way, the way that neem oil works is it's gonna suffocate, it's gonna coat and suffocate any kind of insect or disease. Now, most likely I don't have any disease issues here, but that will help if there were any insect issues in there. If I've got any spider mites or mealy bug or lace bug or any of those things that can get in there, um, then the neem oil will hope to, hope to suffocate it. Plus it's gonna be a good preventative as well. Um, so it's a great time when you do prune something back if you notice that you've got an issue. It's a great time to spray because you don't have all that foliage that's protecting it. I've cut it all off, I've got it down to its bare uh, knuckles and I can spray it and treat it at that point. But you can see all of those new shoots in there. All that new growth is just gonna come out and explode. This basket's gonna be gorgeous in a few weeks. So that's how you can really kind of rehab a hanging basket that maybe has gotten big and out of control. Uh, let's see, if you use something like flower tone, do you just uh, top dress every couple weeks? Yes. So Brooke, great question. With any kind of granular food, especially an organic one like flower tone or our organic green leaf, then you're gonna wanna do that about every three weeks, two to three weeks would be fine. Uh, because it's a lighter organic formula, you're not gonna hurt it. And yes, you just put it right on the top. Try not to get it on the foliage because that can burn little holes in the leaves of the foliage. So try and lift up the plant, get it under there if you can, um, and you're gonna be good. If you do get it on the leaves, just take your hand and just kind of brush it off as much as you can. Uh, when you water it, it's gonna activate those little granulars um, and it's gonna cause the leaves to burn. So try not to wash it off with water. Try and uh, get it down to the soil level as best you can. So that's how you do it. That's how you do a hanging basket. Would, would you use Super Thrive after a hard pruning like that to help? And you know, Wendy, you read my mind. I always have my Super Thrive around. Yes, I would love to use Super Thrive. In this case, I fed it. So I'm gonna give it probably about a week to kind of use some of that food. Um, and then I'll probably come back with a Super Thrive. You can do Super Thrive first and then feed it later. And that might've been maybe the better option, Wendy, is because did I cause it some stress? Yes, a little bit. It's going to kind of not be real happy with me because it doesn't care what it looks like. It just wants to grow. And I've taken all of this off. And so it might be a little upset at me. Um, and giving it some Super Thrive really does help. And for all of you out there watching that don't know what Super Thrive is, it is a vitamin supplement. It is not a fertilizer, but it takes the shock off of stressed out plants. So when you cause a stress to a plant, whether you're transplanting it or whether you just don't know what's going on with your plant, it's just struggling for some reason, it's not insect, it's not disease, I'm watering it correctly, I'm giving it the food that it wants, uh, but it's just not growing, it's going through some sort of shock and it's hard for us to tell. Plants don't talk to us. So Super Thrive usually takes the shock off the plant. It's an awesome, awesome little solution. It's a little vitamin supplement. It's a, a liquid, you mix it, it's like a teaspoon per gallon. It goes a long way. Um, so it's a really, really good uh, option to use. And yes, Wendy, that would have been a great option. I could have used my Super Thrive on that and then come back and fed it a couple weeks later and it would have been booming. Uh, so you can do both. Now, I don't think I hurt it that much, so I think I'm gonna be fine. Um, if it were uh, something where 
I, it was just really drastic prune. I mean, just like all the way down to just some twigs or almost down to ground level, then I probably would have. All right, let me clean up my mess here. But that's how we can clean up a hanging basket, get it refreshed real quick. And then that's typically not going to be done until we get to about the July timeframe at the earliest. And then even August usually is when that's really going to be something that's needed. Um, and sometimes you don't even have to need that. Sometimes you're perfectly fine. Um, so that's the three, that's the four things that I definitely want to talk about when we talk about keeping our hanging baskets thriving is deadheading, feeding, feeding properly, watering properly, and then pruning if necessary. Now pruning sometimes is done just to keep your plants shapely. You know, if I needed to go in and take this dragon wing begonia and kind of prune it to kind of help it shape, or maybe it's getting too big for the space that I have it in, you can do some pruning and that's pretty easy. You just follow it down to where you see that you want to prune. I usually go a little bit deeper than I typically might. Instead of just taking off the top, I'll go in and prune it down a little bit deeper and that allows it to flush a little bit more evenly. If I prune it up here at the top, you might get some straggly growth because again, plants are going to grow from a terminal bud. And if we take that off, it's going to break more underneath and you're going to get more growth. So if I do it at the top, it's going to grow a little bit faster here than over here that I didn't prune. So prune a little bit deeper. It helps it kind of keep it a little bit fuller. Um, I need that super five for my baskets. Thanks for the great info. Yeah, Lillian, you will love it. I use super thrive all the time. Uh, I had a huge camellia, cut it down to like the stump, Use Super Thrive on it. I probably used a little bit more than I needed to, but you can't hurt it. Um, and man, two or three years later, that thing was is, is the prettiest camellia I've ever seen. It's absolutely gorgeous and it blooms like crazy. And it was a straggly old one. Been around probably for 30, 35 years in this yard um, that uh, was my previous home. So Super Thrive is awesome whenever we're doing anything drastic. A lot of bonsai uh, growers use it uh, to kind of help with bonsai plants because they're stressed out. You know, they're being kept in this tiny little pot. Um, so it's a great little product to have around. It's a great thing to have in your you know, plant medicine cabinet um, just in case you don't know what's going on and you want to give it a little bit of vitamin supplement. It's a great option for you. All right, so now I want to talk about just some things. I just want to kind of talk about some different hanging baskets. I want to show you some of my favorites here. So let's do that first and then um, I'll get into some different ideas for hanging baskets and then I'll show you all the different uses for them as well. So let me show you some of my favorites. My, my number one favorite is scovola. Uh, I don't know if you've ever grown scovola as a hanging basket, but it is one of my favorites. It can grow in sun or shade, so it's very, very versatile. This plant could almost look like it is dead. Uh, if you miss some waterings, this plant will hang. It looks like just a dead weed. I mean, it just looks awful. And then you water it and it perks right back up. And so it's really, really hard to kill. It's very, very durable. It blooms like crazy all summer. It has this, obviously, this trailing habit. So you can see it's almost completely uh, covered up the hanging basket from underneath. But I love how it kind of hangs down and then pops back up. So you kind of get to really see that bloom. It's a really pretty one. It's a really awesome plant. This is just the purple and white mix. It also comes in straight purple. See, I think I grabbed one. So this is just fabulous hanging basket. Just love that color, almost a bluish purple color, uh, that dark green leaf. Uh, and when you feel the leaf, it almost feels a little bit like a succulent. Um, so it's very, very strong. It's very, very durable. One of my favorites, love this one. Uh, what would you recommend, Milku Grow Liquid? Um, so I, I don't recommend a lot of the Milku Grow products and it's not because I don't like Milku Grow. I just have a lot of different ones that we carry and support. Um, so like the Schultz, Plant food is the one that I recommend. It's very similar. It's a 10, 15, 10, whereas most of your milk grows, I think, are like 20, 20, 20. Um, I do have a 20, 20, 20 uh, water soluble that's very similar to milk grow. It's made by the Fertilone company that makes this blooming and rooting. So, yeah, I don't have a problem with milk grow. Typically, what milk grow lacks is the micronutrients and the trace elements. And you're not going to typically get that in a liquid, which is why I always like my green leaf plant foods uh, because they have those trace elements and those smaller nutrients that I think are really, really beneficial. Not as important as the macronutrients, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but very, very important. All right, so uh, some of my other, uh, of course, my dragon wing. I absolutely love dragon wing hanging baskets. I just think they're graceful, they're classic, they're traditional, and they love shade. So it's really hard to get a lot of color and a lot of you know, really nice green growth in a shady spot. And this one does an amazing job. So dragon wing begonias are absolutely amazing. And of course, 
What do you do in full sun? Well, they came out with a dragon wing. They call them big leaf, but these are bronze leaf dragon wing begonias, basically. Let's see if they call it dragon wing. I know they, they had a whopper, so whopper, big leaf uh, is what they're calling them, but that is a really nice burgundy leaf, and that means that this one can take more sun, and then you get these red blooms on it. So I just love the art, the, the architecture of it, the, the shape of it, the texture. It's really, really cool. It's just a different looking plant, and you don't have to deadhead them. And these just bloom all summer long. So it's a really, really great option. So you've got them for the shade and you've got them for the sun. Really, really great one. I showed you the lantana earlier. Another great hanging basket for full sun. This will attract hummingbirds uh, and bees and butterflies. Lantana is awesome. It doesn't stop when it gets hot. So when we get into those 90 degree days, this is a great one to have around. Uh, and especially if you're trying to attract hummingbirds and butterflies and bees to the garden, you could put a shepherd's hook out in your vegetable garden and put a lantana basket or two if you get a double shepherd hook. Put a couple of those out there and you're going to attract a lot of pollinators, which then are going to pollinate your plants as well. So lantana is a great one. Plus it's deer resistant and so nothing really messes with them. Um, let's see, what else are some of my favorites? I absolutely love New Guinean patience. Really pretty colors. Don't have to deadhead these as well. So you know like our typical garden impatience are smaller leafed. I find them to be slightly messy. Um, they drop a lot of petals. You don't have to deadhead them, but uh, I love New Guineas with this big leaf. They're very similar to the Sun Patients, which we carry Sun Patients in hanging baskets as well. Uh, so you can grow them in full sun. This one does great in the shade. So on a covered porch or a patio or something uh, that's got a little bit of shade on it, this is gonna do absolutely amazing. Um, what else? We've got, oh, Purse Lane or Perchalaca, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, the, the purse lane is the one with the flat leaf, which is what this one is. So now this hasn't quite grown out as much because we haven't had a lot of heat yet. And I think my blooms are actually already slightly closing up. So let me see if you can see, oh, there's one. So what's cool about purse lane or Perchalaca is the blooms will actually close at night. So they need sun, so they need full sun. In full sun, this thing is gonna open up just tons of blooms. It's going to be covered in blooms. And then at night, they all close back up and this will look completely green again. But what's cool about this is it's a succulent. So it is very, very drought tolerant. So it can take that really, really hot, dry sun. And if you've got a space that you can't quite get to and water as much, but you want a really pretty hanging basket, this is a great option. I know it doesn't look like much right now, but when this thing gets covered with those really pretty blooms, it's got this pink uh, petal with that yellow center. They're really, really gorgeous. So a really pretty one, and it'll trail. It'll trail for days coming out of the basket. So it's a really, really nice one. Uh, let's see, what else? Of course, there's lots of different types of petunias. Petunias are a great one, look at that. You can find a lot of really cool looking petunias in hanging baskets, typically. Uh, Miso vine. So miso vine is probably not one that a lot of us know about, but miso vine is a really cool one. Not really known for its bloom, more for its foliage. So really, really pretty color. Uh, it's got that white and green variegation, the white edge around the green leaf. Um, but this is also a succulent. So it's a very, very drought tolerant plant. I actually love this one in a little bit of shade. So with a little bit of shade, I think they do a little bit better, but I've seen them growing in full sun, completely spectacular. They're a great combo, uh, a great plant in a combo planter, uh, cause it has that trailing habit. They do get a little red bloom. Let's see, I think I've got different petals mixed in here. Oh, there's one. So you see right in there, that little tiny red bloom. So they're not really known for the blooms. It's kind of similar to an ice plant bloom, um, but uh, they're not really known for the blooms. They're really known for uh, that really awesome foliage. What else do I have around here? I got lots of hanging baskets around. So of course uh, you can't have, you know, a really pretty porch without a nice Boston fern hanging basket. These are awesome. Uh, a quintessential classic, you could say. Uh, Boston ferns are just awesome with that green foliage. Great again for the shade. I guess I didn't bring a lot of sun containers in. I guess the ones behind me could be. I'll show you those in a second. Well, actually this one's a little bit more shade. But a Boston fern is a great hanging basket. Uh, it's just a really, really pretty option for a shady spot. Porches, patios, they look great when you've got you know four or five of them lined up on a porch. Really, really great look. So of course, Boston ferns are a good option. Maybe you want to grow food in hanging baskets, right? So we can do that. I actually just did a webinar on growing uh, edible plants in small spaces, and there's nothing uh, more beneficial to growing vertically, growing something up that's up in the air. So this is a strawberry hanging basket. As you can see, the strawberries coming out, 
and that little pink bloom there. So this one actually blooms pink and gets a strawberry. Uh, so this is a great way of growing some edible plants. You can also do herbs in hanging baskets. Look at this mint. You know, mint goes wild, but if you use mint in teas throughout the summer or in mojitos, this is mojito mint. Um, so this is a really, really great plant. It's also got that great fragrance keeps insects away so you can you know keep this on your porch or patio and you can sit out there and enjoy the fragrance yourself as well as keep some insects away so mint is a great option uh, really good one for a hanging basket and you can use it and this one as you can see needs to be used remember I just talked about pruning this guy needs to be pruned somebody needs to make some some mojitos one night um, so you can pick this up have a mojito party and then uh, your plants will continue to grow and look great after that all right so let's see and then of course don't forget your indoor spaces. There are so many, I didn't grab a whole lot of options, but I did grab a couple. Uh, indoor spaces, there's a lot of options for hanging baskets. I grabbed this little moss fern. This is really pretty, I think that's what this is. Uh, fern gold moss, so yep, it's a gold moss fern. Uh, so it looks like moss, it's gonna trail over the sides. And this is great, I grabbed this one because you can grow these in low light spaces. So if you've got a, a bedroom or a space in your kitchen that doesn't get a lot of light, but you want a hanging basket, there's options for you. Maybe you want something that's a little bit more bright light. So I've got this Swiss cheese philodendron. This is really, really cool. My daughter has one of these in her windows. Uh, her window doesn't get a whole ton of light, but it's a good afternoon sunlight window. Um, but these are pretty versatile, medium to high light. Uh, so really, really great option. And there's so many different options. There's succulents, there's cactus. There's tons and tons of different options for inside your house. Really, really great option to bring some more plants inside your home and use hanging baskets around your home. It's a great option, really. Um, if you prune the begonias, can you propagate the cuttings? Uh, Frida, I'm sure you probably could. Um, that is one thing that I've always lacked is, is propagation expertise. I don't really know. I, I'm assuming you can. I would make, uh, I know, make a 45 degree angle cut and then uh, use some rooting hormone, which we carry, just the powder. You dip the cutting in water, dip it in some rooting powder, and then put it in some soil. The problem, Frida, that I don't know is when is the best time, and that's typically the issue is when do you wanna start cuttings, and that's really dependent on temperature and season. Um, so inside, you could probably do it if you've got a grow light or something uh, that you can do it inside, um, but that would be the only thing that I don't know, Frida, is um, if you make those cuttings, when is the best time to plant them? Because uh, it might be better just to kind of chuck them and let the plant regrow. Um, and so that, that is one uh, thing that I just, I've never really, really kind of, I need to develop. I need to kind of learn a little bit more about propagation. Um, but that's a great question and I'm sure you can. Uh, whether you gotta let it callous over before you do it, I'm not sure. Um, so, but I'm sure there's a lot of great information out there. There's a, a gentleman here named um, uh, Brendan who is absolutely amazing here at the Garden Center. So Frida, if you're in the area and you are really interested in learning about that, either Sarah or Brendan probably would be able to help you um, with knowing that. Uh, regular begonias, so, so Wendy I know does a lot of gardening. Uh, regular begonias can be cut and stick in some water and they will root right away. Uh, probably the dragon ring will do that too, but I haven't tried it. So there you go. You can do it right in water, let it root, and then plant it in some soil. Give it a try. I mean, it's, it's worth it. If you're making the cuttings because you need to, then you might as well try. All right, so those are some of my favorites. Some different ideas as well. Think outside the box. Use herbs, use veggies, um, use them inside. So hang plants inside. There's lots and lots of different uses for hanging baskets. All right, so one of my favorite things to do, here's my first you know, tip or different ways of using hanging baskets is in a container, right? So we can hang hanging baskets. We've talked about that. You can hang them up. Very, very easy to do. But what if you have a pot, you got a party coming up or you just love this hanging basket so much and you want to put it in a container. Uh, very easy to do. All you got to do is pop the hook off. This is really, really a great option. So if you've got something coming up, uh, <laughs> thanks for, um, so if you uh, got an event coming up, you've got you know a party or something and you've got this empty pot and you just need to fill it up, I grabbed this one and then all I did was just put a couple br bricks down on the bottom. So it doesn't have to be bricks, it could be styrofoam. You could fill it a little bit with potting soil if you wanted to. You could build a riser out of anything. You could actually plant this in this pot. However, for this, for this uh, quick fix, I'm just gonna show you how you can just pop this right in. 
So all of these hooks can come out. Of course, this one is going to be a little bit trickier to get out. So I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll use a different hanging basket. Because this one has a different kind of clip system in it. Let's see how challenging this is going to make it for me. Yeah, I think I might. No. Well, there we go. All right. So this one's just got a different clip system. There's a lot of different types of hanging baskets and the way that they put the hanging basket top on it. And this one is going to give me a little bit of a fit. So I am, because it's just, it clips underneath. It's a very good secure clip, but this is what you would do is just drop it right in, right? Let me do one that I can actually take the hanger off so you can really see it. Let's do, let's do this great New Guinea Impatient. This is gorgeous. So this one I can get the hanger off real fast. And I always save all of my plastic uh, hanging baskets. So sometimes you might want to plant one up later. Uh, maybe I want to, you know, put this in a pot, but the next year I've got the empty hanging basket and I want to plant some mint in it, or I want to do something different. So all you got to do is just drop this in there. I'm going to take my brick and turn it on its side so it's a little bit taller. And it's at that right level. And look at that. Very, very simple. You can do it with a combo hanging basket. Look at this one. I didn't show this one yet. This is a, a double impatient with some diamond frost euphorbia and this gorgeous coleus. This is a cocoa lined basket. So that's a great way to add a basket into a container. Now I could actually take this out of the pot and plant it in some soil. So I could fill this up with potting soil, take it out of the pot, stick it in there, and I'm good to go. And it actually will actually probably do a little better. So I would recommend that. But if you're in a rush and you've got people coming over and you want a quick fix, this is a very, very quick fix, and it looks like you planted it, and it looks like you've been growing it all season. That's what I really love about hanging baskets, is these are started before all of that smaller stuff that you buy. So these have been growing in greenhouses, you know, typically since, you know, January, February, to get some size on them so that we can have them in the spring season. And then all your other four inch and six inch plants are started after that. So hanging baskets are first, they're gonna be bigger, they're gonna be fuller. So if you're looking for some impact, you're gonna get it with hanging baskets. So let's move that back over here. So one way, drop it into a, into a container. Another thing that you can do um, is you can upgrade your hanging basket. This is a really cool, easy technique. You know, we love these cocoa line baskets and we've got one right here. So you can buy a nice cocoa lined hanging basket. Uh, this one is actually a plastic pot, but it's got the cocoa liner in it but it's got this really, really huge plant. And you're gonna grow bigger plants with the bigger basket, for sure. So what I can do is I can put some soil in here. That's pretty easy. I can put some soil in here and then I could plant you know, a hanging basket in there. Or if you're in a rush, we can just drop it in there and slip it right in. Again, it's just a way of turning your typical, regular green, white hanging basket pot into a nice, so this is called my hanging basket upgrade. So it's really easy to do. Take this other hook out of here. And this is a wire hook. So all this is done is just kind of wrapped around the bottom or wrapped through the hole. So all you got to do is just unwrap it and pull it out. So get that hook out of here. And then I'm just going to drop it into this really pretty hanging basket. And then we'll just bring this chain right back around it. Now, probably the best thing to do is probably to unhook it first, but I'm gonna try and do this real fast. Just so you can see how simple that really is. Work it through, and then I've got my hanging basket upgraded, just like that. So I just took this nice cocoa line hanging basket and just dropped the other pot right in it, and it looks great, it looks really, really nice. So that's a great way of upgrading a hanging basket very simply and very easily. And of course you can plant it in there and plant it in there is gonna be a little bit more longevity. Cocoa line baskets are great uh, because they allow airflow through it. Now these are gonna dry out a little bit faster. So I do warn you, if you don't love the water, then don't use cocoa line or plastic is not gonna allow as much air and they're gonna last a little bit longer with holding moisture but a cocoa line basket is gonna allow air to pass through into the soil. It's gonna dry some of the roots, but it's gonna make your plants grow much, much bigger. So cocoa line baskets are actually beneficial to the plant as well as looking really, really nice and fancy. Um, so, but just be warned, you will probably water a little bit more, especially when we get real, real warm. All right, what else can you do with hanging baskets? Well, 
I've got this gorgeous petunia. I found this. A lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to find different plants that are in hanging baskets that you wouldn't typically find um, in, uh, in just a four inch or a six inch pot. So maybe you want to plant them in your landscape. That's very, very easy to do. Take the hook off and plant this right in the landscape. And man, especially if you've got a party coming up or, you know, if you go and you do some math, if you buy some hanging baskets that are on sale, which a lot of times they are, then then you go check the price of a six inch pot and you would say, okay, how many six inch are in here? Well, there's probably three plants in here. Typically in a 12 to 14 inch plant, you're gonna have anywhere from three, four to five separate plants in there. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. But with this, you're basically getting the impact of three six inch and you're probably gonna spend a little bit more buying six inch if you just buy one hanging basket. Now you can split these apart but what I would do is just plant it just like this. Take the pot off, take the plant out of the pot, drop it into your landscape, drop it into your flower beds, and you've got some instant impact. So this is a great option is to plant them in your landscape. I would do it with petunias. I would do it with dragonweed begonias. There's lots and lots of choices of, of plants that I would just take right out and put them in the landscape. Especially if you're gonna plant a bunch of small stuff, why not just get a big hanging basket and put it in the landscape? It's awesome what it can do for you. All right. So then my final thing that I want to show you is how to make a combo out of a hanging basket. This is one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's really, really easy to do. So I've got this nice big pot here and we're going to turn this into a combo pot. So again, a lot of times you won't find what maybe you want in a four or six inch pot. So maybe you see something in a hanging basket and you're like, I would love that in my combo pot. I love making combinations. One of my favorite things to do in the spring um, is taking all of these different plants, putting them together and making this gorgeous combination. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some hanging baskets to do that today. And I'm going to show you because it'll show you how you can actually split some plants apart um, and get a really big impactful combo planter uh, for instant gratification, but also Again, like I mentioned, these plants have been growing a little bit longer, so you're going to get bigger plants out of a hanging basket typically than you would in a four or six inch plant. First thing I need is my McDonald potting tool. So I got a bag right here. I'm going to open this up. And we're just going to fill this up a little bit. I got this big, nice big pot because I'm using hanging baskets. So I know I'm going to fill this up pretty easily. So that pot right there took a whole bag of potting soil and it's going to need a little bit more too. But this is a gorgeous pot. We just got a great collection of ceramic pots in. Uh, so we've got more and more containers to work with. So if you haven't planted one up or maybe you ran out of pots and you need a new one, we've got plenty here. So all I did was just put this straight in, uh, potting soil straight in. A good quality potting soil is going to look like this. It's going to be nice and light and it's going to have perlite in it and peat and vermiculite. It's going to be really, really nice and it's not going to form into a, a muddy ball. If you squeeze it, it's going to still fall apart. So we got a good potting soil in there. I don't have to put anything down in the bottom. I could have if I wanted to. I could put rock down there if it's a plastic pot to weigh it down. I could put some styrofoam down there if I needed to. Uh, but I typically just say put potting soil in there. The only issue that could ever occur is if my drain hole gets clogged up. But I check that every so often. Just lean over the pot. Just check with your finger. Make sure it's not uh, clogged up and you're good to go. And a good potting soil shouldn't clog up your drain hole. Should be perfectly fine. All right. So I've got that in there. Now, what most hanging baskets don't have is a big center plant. So my thriller. Whenever I talk about making combinations, I use my three components, my thriller, filler, and spiller. So a thriller is typically your upright plant's going to add some height. So that's the only thing I'm going to have to do that's going to be separate from a couple hanging baskets. I've got this great spike. I love maroon spikes. They're very, very easy to work with and very easy to use. So we've got this great spike here. So I'm going to just gently squeeze the pot, get that out. And let's see, we need to bring this up a little bit. You can see those roots are flared out, so I don't need to rough it up too much. It's not super, super root bound, so I don't need to rough it up too much to uh, allow those roots to take into the soil, but I do need a little bit higher. So I always like when I'm planting up a container to make sure that I've got a little bit of an edge. So I don't want it right at the same height as my pot. I actually want it a little bit lower. So I went too high there because I want to give myself a lip to be able to water. So when I water my container, I don't have to sit there and water it and let the water soak off the top. Um, it gives a little bit of a, of, of a well basically uh, to hold the moisture in. All right. So I've got my centerpiece in. 
Now, what I think I'm going to use is this New Guinea Impatient, this coral New Guinea Impatient. Really great contrast color. Love that color. Look at that. Kind of that peachy, kind of corally color. So I need to move some things off my table here. So I got a little bit more space to work in. And I want you to be able to see how to kind of open these up and break these apart. Now, not every single plant can be taken apart. Now, obviously in here, I've got probably three different types of lantanas. You can see all the different colors, but sometimes plants come from the center point. Great example is this uh, red spike here. It all goes to one point, I can't split that. But whenever you're thinking about using a hanging basket for a combo planter, um, look inside the planter. So if you look inside there, you can see there's one plant. There's another plant. I can see actually where all those plants are meeting uh, inside the pot. So I know that I can actually split those up. So since I'm taking this apart, and this is another one of those tricky hanging baskets, isn't it? But I'm gonna try and get this hook off because I like to be able to save my pot if I can. <laughs> Some of these are tricky to get out. There we go. All right, just bear with me for a second because I do want to take this hook off. And I do like to try and recycle my pots because every once in a while we'll break a pot around here. You know, that happens sometimes. And if it ever happens to you, we do sell plastic hang hanging basket pots. They're very, very uh, inexpensive. So if you accidentally drop your hanging basket or something happens, a windstorm comes through, $4.99, you can get yourself a new hanging basket very, very easily. All right, now I'm getting the hang of it. <laughs> Most of them just clip over the side and it's pretty easy. These go actually through a double hole in the side of the pot. So it just takes a little bit longer to get this out. All right, there we go. So I've taken my hook out and this is gonna be my filler. So this is gonna be my kind of blooming plant that stays right in this kind of general area. Now these are New Guinea impatient, so they can get bigger, but what can I do if they get too big? I can always prune them if I need to. So I'm just gonna take this right out of the pot. You can see that. Now most hanging baskets are gonna have um, a uh, kind of uh, drainage kind of support system underneath. So you're gonna see this a lot. See that black plastic piece? So that you can just easily slip right off and pop it in there. Now sometimes you're going to find it's going to be super, super root bound in there, which is good. This one's not crazy root bound. It's got lots and lots of nice looking roots, but um, it's not really, really crazy root bound. Now what I love to do is use a table here. So I'm going to actually put it on the table. I'm going to try and turn it around so that you can see it. I'll try and do this opposite. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look in here and I'm going to find my plants. So I've got I've got three in here. I've got three nice big plants. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to basically put my hand right where I know that there's two plants or that I've got a plant here and a plant here. So this is my root system of my two plants. So I'm just going to take my hands and just gently, gently divide it. I don't need a knife. I don't need to really kind of do anything to hurt this plant. And I'm just going to gently separate that. Now I'm going to turn it to the side and get it to the other uh, area. And basically what you're doing is just working your thumb through, just trying to get that, and I'm not trying to rip it. So I'm just, I'm gonna hear some popping of some roots and that's okay. I'm just gently working my way through it. So I don't have to rush, I just take my time and just keep on working through. The hardest part is gonna be in the center because that's where the roots have kind of you know, worked in intertwined each other. Uh, so they've kind of gotten kind of wrapped around each other a little bit, but we're just gently, slowly, but surely working these plants apart. So I'm, I'm putting some force into it, but I'm not ripping real hard because I don't want to hurt my plants. And there we go. So I've got three nice size plants now. Now these are bigger than any six inch plant that I'm going to have out there. And I'm going to use these all the way around. So I'll pop that one in there. And just look at that impact. I mean, look at how big that is. It's huge. So, I mean, there's just no way that I can get that with a smaller plant initially. Put that one in there. 
And now I don't need to like rough up the sides or anything because I've already roughed this plant up enough. And windy, I would probably use my Super Thrive after this. What I will use, because I haven't mentioned this one yet, is my Biotone Starter. If you don't know about Biotone Starter, it is awesome. It is a great starter fertilizer. You do need to get it to the root system of the plants, but it's got beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizae that attach themselves to the roots and they form a symbiotic relationship that lasts the entirety of the plant, the entirety of the life of the plant. So I'm gonna put this in as my initial plant food. So I don't need, it's also got nutrients in here. So it's a 433, it's made by a spoma. It's kind of like a root stimulator. So you know the old fashioned liquid root stimulator, it's very similar to that. And I'm just gonna put that right in there. Now it's right on the root system of all of these plants. And my final plant is gonna be, of course, my spiller. So now I've gotta put in something that's gonna trail over the sides. And what else would I use than my favorite scovola? So we're gonna use this right here. So same, same process, same technique. I'm just gonna take my hook off, which this is a wire hook, so this will be a lot easier. So we'll just pop this guy off. And now Scavola is tough. So I can be pretty, pretty rough with this guy and it's not gonna hurt it. That's why I love this plant. It's very, very tough, very durable. So I've got this red spike, I've got this New Guinea impatient, um, and I've got the Scavola. Now the red spike uh, will do fine in a little bit of shade, uh, but also will do fine in a little bit of sun, in full sun. The New Guineas can actually take full sun or a little bit of shade. So this container is going to be really, really good in an area that gets some shade, but also gets sun. Um, so maybe, you know, if I've got a spot that gets like two or three hours of really bright afternoon sun, it's gonna be perfectly fine. Even if it's in a lot of shade, it's gonna do perfectly fine. Uh, so this is a very, very great, uh, very, very good option. So we got the hook off, we got the hanging pot off. Does it have an insert on the bottom? Nope, nothing on the bottom. Look at that root system though. Now we can see why that plant is so strong. Look at that great looking root system. Nice and white, really pretty. Okay, so now the trick is with a trailing plant, so like sweet potato vine, I used to do this all the time with sweet potato vine uh, because you get the big, huge sweet potato vine. So if I'm planting up a container for somebody and they want it big and impactful, I'm gonna really resort to a hanging basket first because they've been grown for longer. So I'm gonna get those nice long trailers. So you know, you go find a scavola out there that is as big as this, good luck. So what I gotta do is I gotta look in here and try and find my plants. Okay, I got them. Got my three. So now I know where they are. It's a little bit harder because it's a little bit harder to see them. And then the trick is gonna be how much has the top intertwined? How much has the top kind of worked its way over top of itself? So that's what we've gotta find. So there we go, we got that side separated. And this one actually is coming apart pretty easily, pretty well. So just find my, make sure you find your plants before you start pulling. And then once we've got one, I kind of usually just give it a general kind of light shake. You see that? so that I can see that they're separating off. Perfect. So I'm trying not to rip the top because I want all my trailers on there as much as I possibly can get them. And that's the tricky part about this is the tops are gonna grow into itself. So we're just gonna gently pull and try not to rip it. So again, using some four, there we go. Now I got this great big hunk of scavola. It's a really, really great option here. All right, now I need a little bit more soil just to kind of bring it up to height. So I'm just gonna fill in my holes. All right, got that up to the height that I needed at. And then I can take my first big piece of scola that I've got. And this is just trailing all over the place. I'm gonna force it to kind of really trail out one side. And man, look at that. I mean, that is really look like it's been in there for a long time. All right, go back in and find my other two. 
Then we got to do the hard thing of trying to get them separated again. There we go. Scavola can take it though. That's the good thing. And that was definitely the biggest chunk for sure. That one was the dominant Scavola of that group. But man, look at that impact in there. That is just awesome. That's why I absolutely love using hanging baskets for my planters. Pop this last piece, and that's a pretty big piece too. So now what you can do, what I love to do with combo planters is manipulate your plants. You know, use them to put them where you want them to be. So this one's got a huge trailer over here. Where was it? Right here. So I'm actually take that and kind of go behind. And that way it's kind of filling in this other space up here and it looks like it's popping up over the top. And I'll show you all of this here in a second. And you're gonna lose some pieces here and there. You're gonna break some stuff, that's okay. And that's why I use tough, durable plants because I know that they can take it. So I got this other one that's huge. I'm gonna take some of it and put it up in here. So look at that and just let it just kind of wrap around and pop up here and there because that's what Scavola can do is it can just kind of almost like a vine just kind of work around and be everywhere. And then there we go. So all I gotta do now is just kind of fill it in with some soil around the gaps and I'm ready to roll. And so I've got this gorgeous, look at that. I mean, it looks like this container has been growing all season long and I just planted it. And that's because the plants have been growing all season long. They've just been in hanging baskets. So really, really awesome planter here. Love that combination. I got that coral color with that dark burgundy eye that's pulling out the burgundy on the spike. And then a great contrasting color with my purple scavola. Love this pot. It's got a lot of burgundy in it. It's got some burgundy colors in it. I know you can't quite see it on the, on the uh, screen, but it's got some blue in it, which is pulling out the blue of my scavola. It's got some burgundy in there as well. Really pretty pot. Great looking combo. So now I've just got to fill this in with some soil, get it watered, and I've got a great combination that looks like it's been growing for a long time. So really cool way of using hanging baskets is in a combination of different plants. Uh, it just adds impact. It adds uh, this sense that it's been in, the, in your yard, in your garden for a long time and you can really put on a show using hanging baskets. So those are some of my favorite ways of using hanging baskets. Upgrade them with a cocoa liner, pop them into a, a pot, you know, you just take the, the, hang, the hanger off of it, just set it right into a pot, use some risers, plant it in the pot, put it in your landscape, use it in your landscape. And then of course, use them and break them apart and use them in combination planters. And if you don't wanna break them apart, then I could have done this differently. I could have taken that spike and put it towards the back put the hanging basket of the um, New Guinea impatient on one side and put the scabola on the other side. It doesn't have to be a kind of perfect round symmetrical shape like this. It could have been just three elements in there. You still get your thriller, your spiller and your filler. And then of course, use hanging baskets as they were intended to be used. Hang them up, you know, go out there and put a bunch on your front porch, whether it's a fern, whether it's a combination like this, there's so many different uses and of course, Hanging baskets in your home is a great way. Think of all the different ways that you can use them with edibles. You can t find small tomato plants that don't get very big. You can grow a tomato in a hanging basket. Mint, you know, your indoor plants, there's so many different options. Strawberries, uh, the list goes on and on. So there's a lot of things that I probably didn't cover, but those are some of my favorite ways to use hanging baskets and some of my favorite hanging baskets and my tips and trips, uh, tips and tricks to keep them blooming all season long. So hopefully this helped. I'm gonna see if there's any other questions, but I enjoyed doing this. It was a lot of fun. I love this container. I'm gonna get this finished up and get it back out on the sales yard and, and put it on sale. So, so anybody can come and get this great gorgeous container that was just planted up that looks like it's been growing for a long time. All right, so let's see, we got any questions here. All right, Sherry said, I had to use my garden saw on a root-bound canna lily. I divided it into two pots. Luckily, it rained because I forgot to super thrive afterward. Sherry, rain is like super thrive, isn't it? Rain is just an absolutely amazing thing for the garden. Uh, it just does wonderful things, and we need some in this area right now. Um, let's see. <laughs> Nene said, uh, inspired, you make it look so easy. It really is very easy. Um, so it's very, very easy 
to, to take these plants. It takes a little bit of practice to kind of get the separating thing done, but take your time. Uh, just kind of use your hands and just work it gently. Um, it might take you, you know, 10 minutes to really get those plants apart. Uh, but don't be afraid. Most plants are very, very tough and durable. Something like the impatient is going to be real easy to break apart because they don't really kind of mix. That scavola is a little bit harder to do because all of those uh, have kind of crossed, crisscrossed each other and they form this kind of uh, intertwined mess uh, that is a little bit harder to get apart. But sweet potato vine works great. Coleus, we've got some gorgeous coleus hanging baskets. So if you want a coleus hanging basket, you can pull all the different pieces out of it. So you've got a lot of options to do it. Uh, and of course, using something like our Biotone starter afterwards is gonna help redevelop root system. Something like the Super Thrive is gonna take the shock off. So that's probably what I'll do, is I'll probably water this down once I get it really planted, uh, and then I'll use my Super Thrive as my first watering uh, once I get this all planted up. Uh, so great question. Uh, Wendy said, could you suggest a Thriller plants for part shade to shade? Well, really this, this spike works great. This is a quarter line. Uh, any kind of quarter line would work great. If you want something maybe a little bit bigger, I love those Majesty Palms. Majesty Palms are a good one. Even some ferns are not a bad one, uh, especially like your, maybe not your macho, but your Kimberly Queen fern. Boston and machos tend to drape a lot, but Kimberly Queen can kind of stay pretty vertical. Uh, think about houseplants. A lot of houseplants, Wendy, will work great. A snake plant would be amazing in the shade. They do, they love the shade outside. Now you're gonna have to bring it in during the winter. Um, but what else? Green spikes work. Uh, even something like the dragon wing begonia is gonna put some height on it. Uh, let's see, I think that's probably, I mean, there's of course some shrubs that would work fine, like boxwoods. You can find like the pillar boxwoods. Uh, sky pencil holly can take a little bit of shade, probably would prefer sun. Uh, Podocarpus would probably work pretty well. Uh, some of the yews. Now those are all shrubs, so I'm trying to think of something in the annual perennial family that really is going to be a great thrill. I mean, I love the houseplant ideas. Quarter lines, all your spikes do fine in shade, so even this red spike or uh, the green spikes, those will work perfectly fine in some shade. Um, and then uh, th think about the houseplants because there's a lot of really pretty quarter lines, majesty palms, ferns that work great as a thriller. So hopefully that helps Wendy some options for you. Uh, and the snake plant is absolutely amazing. Uh, if you ever want to see any of my previous webinars, they're on our webpage. You just go to our webpage, click on my link, the Garden Guru link, and you can watch all your past, all my past webinars. I did one last year on show stopping, I think is what we call it, show stopping containers, where I used a snake plant, Wendy, and it turned out fabulous. All right, so Sherry said, so pretty, I'm about to make a combo basket of pothos. Great option. Yeah, so pothos is a great one, uh, like the neon pothos or the golden pothos is a great trailer. So yes, I always say use house plants. I mean, if you possibly can, use an outdoor, a, 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 a indoor plant outside. You know, Mother Nature didn't intend for any plants to be inside. A lot of them we have found work great inside, and that's what we grow as our indoor plants. And those are great options because they bring the outside in. But they were intended to be outside, so they can grow outside. A lot of those plants inside are gonna prefer a little bit of shade outside, which is windy, why I suggested them for you, because for a shady spot, a lot of those house plants are gonna work great, and there's a lot of thrillers in that category as well. So hopefully that helped everybody. I think I got everybody's question, so enjoy your day, enjoy the weather, it's gonna warm up, so get out there and water if you haven't watered, because watering is gonna be important. Uh, but I hope you all enjoyed this and come in and see us here at McDonald Garden Center. If you live in our neck of the woods, we hope to see you soon. Everybody have a great day. I'll see you next week. We're going to be talking about, uh, oh, my perennials, some of my favorite perennials, uh, tried and true perennials, perennials that we know do really, really well in this area. Uh, so if you live in the Hampton Roads area and you love perennials, it'll be a great one to watch uh, to, to see some of those that we have just been reliable on over many, many years because we know they work great. So let's see what we said. Nanny said, can you have a planting workshop in McDonald's where we can make our own and you look over our work? Uh, that's not a bad option. I will maybe consider doing something. I mean, things are starting to get back to normal, right? We're getting really, really close. So that's not a bad option uh, to come in and do a workshop with me, the Garden Guru, where uh, you know we can all plant up some planters together. Uh, maybe it's something where I can at least walk around and kind of help with picking out the specific types of plants. There's so many options. I love doing this. I love contrasting colors. I love using light colors. I mean, it's really kind of harder to do, but I mean, you can see it in this one. That gorgeous 
double impatient. And then what, what do you see in that coleus? That coleus, there's a little bit of pink all the way in the center of that coleus. And that's hard to see. And sometimes it's hard to do is find that small color and pull it out with a bold color. That's very similar. And then of course, I love that diamond frost euphorbia. So as a good contrast color. So there's so many different things. Great option. We're always looking and we're always trying to think of some different options. I'm going to be doing perennials next week and then I'm going to plant up a succulent container and then we're going to get into the summer months and we're going to gear up for our pollinator week. We've got a lot in store here at the garden center. Memorial day is coming up. Uh, so we've got our Memorial day sales event coming up in a couple weeks. And then we've got pollinator week after that. I'm going to take a little bit of break there um, in the early June period. So I think we've got one scheduled for June 2nd around there uh, on a succulent container that we'll be planting up. Um, and then I'm gonna take a little bit of a breather before we get to the pollinator week. And then we'll be back and we'll be doing more after that. So we love the suggestions, keep them coming. That's a great one. And uh, we'll hopefully be able to pull something off like that pretty soon when we can all uh, kind of come together again and get back to normal. So we hope to see you in the garden center. I hope you enjoyed this. Have a great day, everybody. And I'll see you next week.